we have kind of a unique history. I'm not from the Human Relations or Human Resources Department. We come from a background that's all about performance. We started out in the early 80s in Seattle. We was myself and one other guy. He was a sports psychologist in a time when sports psychology was still seen as something akin to voodoo or black magic. Right? I'd been a first division rugby player, so I had the team background. He was an individual performer. We set out with a very simple mission. We wanted to work exclusively with individual athletes, isolate and reproduce the elements that led to consistent winning performance. And the key word for us in that was consistent. We saw lots of people who could win on occasion, but what we were interested in is what does it take to do that consistently? So what we did was simply then, out of our own research, bring contemporary technology to the old Greek model, which held that there's three fundamental aspects to performance, mind, body, and spirit. No big revelation there. We built out this three-part model, and don't worry, there's no tests or anything. So we built this thing called mental fitness, which got at the whole mental side of the game, and I'm not going to read all that to you because you're really good at doing that yourselves, but put that together then with what was contemporary physiological work, right? So mind and body, because we'd all seen players who had great physical capabilities, but they couldn't manage their emotions or their moods, et cetera, et cetera. Or at this point in life, we could argue that, well, we're all perfectly mentally fit, but the body's not quite where we might want it in terms of being a competitor anymore. And then you put that together with the realm of spirit, and when we're talking about spirit, we don't mean religion, of course, but the human spirit. What's the passion that you have for whatever it is you're doing? What's your belief system? What are the values that you bring to the enterprise? And where those three things intersect, we saw that there was at least the, the possibility for this consistent high performance that we were after. And we, as I said, worked consistently with individual athletes. We did terrific work. We had one little problem, which was back in those days, Nike and Adidas weren't throwing money at amateur sports like they are now, so all of our clients were broke. So doing great work, not getting paid. It's what we call flaw in the business plan. So we turned our attention to teams, and here we saw the same thing that everybody else has seen, Miss, many of you have probably participated in, which is we could take a group of individual players who as individuals were terrific, but you put them together on a team and the team would stink. And we go, well, rationally that makes no sense, but it happens so often, and not just in sports, that there's clearly something for us here to learn. So we coined this phrase team cohesion back in the mid-80s, and what we looked at then is how do you get a group to function as a unity? So we expanded our model from mind, body, and spirit to mind, body, and team, put in all these aspects about teams, and then of course went to work with all sorts of teams. And we had the opportunity to work with national teams, Olympic teams, professional teams. You heard the Seahawks mentioned, so this was back in the glory days. And as you know, teams come in all sizes. This is the smallest, right? smallest unit of team. These two women came to us. They were amateur bicyclists. They'd never raced a day in their lives. They belonged to a bike club. They'd been to a meeting of their bike club, and at the bike club meeting, they saw a movie about the Ram, Race Across America, transcontinental bike race. And in that movie, it was revealed that no two women had ever done the race on a tandem bike. They said, we're going to do it. Now, we trained them for six months, bearing in mind these are amateurs, so they're keeping their day jobs. Race day comes, they leave the pier at Santa Monica, they're at City Hall in New York in 10 days and 22 hours. Yeah, exactly right, Jesus, right? Now, that's faster than most of us would drive it, right? <laughs> Unless you have small kids in the car, right? right? Now, the cool thing to us, two parts. One, they still hold the women's record, hasn't been touched since. Yeah. And two, they were pronounced by the race physician as perfectly fit to turn around and go back the other way. What do you think they did? Now, now remember, we taught them mental fitness. They got on the bike, pedaled out to LaGuardia, said enough's enough, we proved our point, <laughs> took their trophy and flew home. That's right. Yeah. We don't train dummies. Right? Now, surprisingly to us, this was never part of our business plan. All this success with teams caught the attention of the military. Now, you don't know enough about my personal history, but this is, is quite a bit of a, 
of a divergence uh, in the 70s. I was the guy leading marches down freeways protesting the war. So that I suddenly found myself at Fort Hood, Texas was a little bit of a shock for everybody. Right? Now what we found here was they had the same problems that everybody did. And what we did was we took the work that had been successful with athletes, reshaped it a little bit to the needs of the Army, and these are the results that we produced in a 1,500 soldier brigade. This was six months after we were gone, so not in the afterglow of, of the, the project. But what you see is overweight people. People overweight were down by 66%. Sick calls have been literally cut in half. Drug and alcohol abuse were both down by 60%, and the, uh, the, the PT, physical training test scores, had gone up 25%, unheard of in their world. That in turn led us to work with the Special Forces, Marines, et cetera. At that point, I said to my guys, let's stop for a minute and take stock. What have we learned here? We've had an opportunity to test and develop a body of work in two arenas where performance matters and where you can measure it, first with athletes, then with soldiers. Right? Now, what do we get from that? First thing we saw is that authentic learning, and this is central to everything we're going to talk about for the rest of the day, Authentic learning has to be seen as the development of new competence, right? not the acquisition of information. Too often, and the reason most organizational development efforts fail, right, is they settle for transmitting information and understanding as opposed to building new competence. And we saw early on working with athletes, understanding was the booby prize. It didn't matter if they understood something, was could, th could they do it? That's the part that mattered. Right? So high-performing teams are a commitment-based phenomena. They're not an activity-based phenomena. And once you understand that, and this was the basis out of which this whole body of work called commitment-based management was developed, but once you begin to see and manage commitments instead of activities, the whole world changes for you. Right? We say our culture then is critical. It's not the dreaded touchy-feely stuff. It's essential, and I'm going to say more about that and why later. Commitment then makes it all happen, and when you put that all together, transformational change as opposed to incremental change then becomes possible. And in our world, our axiom about this is incrementalism, which is the norm today, is your enemy. Right? The world's moving too fast. We can't wait and afford incrementalism. So with that, we turned our attention to the corporate world, and as I said to my guys, this is actually going to be a much more challenging arena. Right? Because in the corporate world, there's no timeout, there's no off-season, there's no spring training. By our standards, they don't actually do much in the way of real training. And on every given, in every given organization, there's a vast gap in the level of competence and commitment on the part of the players. So how do we put together something that's going to be effective in that world? Well, we've been fortunate. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to work with some of the great companies in the world. Give you a couple quick examples. All right, AT&T. This was the old AT&T. How many of you remember the old AT&T? It was the phone company. Yes. You remember their customer service motto? <laughs> ah, that's because they didn't have one, right? <laughs> right? No. Well, they had one. It was just unofficial. It was, we're not happy till you're not happy. <laughs> right? And if you ever tried to do business with them, you could see they really brought that to life. Right? It's the wonders of monopoly. Right? So the company gets broken up. Uh, the board says to the consumer products division, which is 40,000 people, this is all their business offices and phone stores, you've got 18 months to turn this around. They're losing $200 million a year. If you can't do it, we'll just shut it all down, do retail through Sears or somebody. So they come to us, put together some work for them. Based on all these principles, we put 6,000 managers through this process. They went from essentially break even to generating a cumulative total of $3 billion in profit for AT&T over the following 48 months. Outside of long distance, they became the most profitable part of the organization. Out of that, AT&T tried to buy us twice, and I sit here today just ever so thankful I didn't fall for it. Right? So I'd be sitting in Parsippany, New Jersey with a whole bunch of really worthless stock. <laughs> now, now Capital One, how many of you know Capital One? Right, you all get mail from them? Still? Yeah. How do you think I feel? I know all these guys. I get letters, the, the, the letters from people I know. I know who that is, and I still can't get them to stop. <laughs> these guys had a completely different challenge. Right? Now, you don't probably know their history. They experienced their business case study on what's known as explosive growth. So imagine this if you can. In 1994, I believe it was, 
little group of investors who saw a possibility in the credit card business, bought the credit card business from Signet Bank. You'd never heard of them. What they bought was about, I guess, 400,000 customers and six, 700 employees. Six years later, they were 17,000 employees, 40 million customers, and they did that all without acquiring anybody. Fastest growing credit card issuer in history. Right? Our job was to enable that explosive growth, and we did it by putting in place this consistent management footprint that was all about commitment-based management as opposed to activity-based management. And they're now a case study, as I said, in, in explosive growth. Their dilemma was they'd set out to be a credit card company, which was great because in those days there, the, the uh, SEC was okay with that. Nowadays they're not, so they had to be a bank, so they've changed themselves but the history is really quite amazing. Now, I understand there's a couple people in here from your local utility, Detroit, is it Detroit Edison, is that what it's called? DET, yeah, yes, a couple, there we go, all right. So, ITRON is a client of ours and a supplier of yours. These people make all the gas, water, and electric meters for utilities, right? So, they came to us, they were looking for, you know, we, we, they were a, 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 a accumulation of seven different companies that had been cobbled together and they didn't have one unified culture and on all these kinds of breakdowns that would come along with that. We put 300 people through there, they invested, what was it, 1.5 million in us and generated about a $35 million savings, which is part of what we promised with our projects and they projected another $100 million in new revenue, all in the space of about 18 months. So we've got a unique body of work. And what I want to point to you now is based on that experience, we've come to see the world a little differently than most folks. Because culture is everything. It's how a firm operates, right? So it's the con continuous success and growth of the three types of capital, financial capital, pragmatic capital, symbolic capital. Right? Now, I'm going to talk about, it's surprising to me how many people that are in business don't actually understand capitalism. There's, in every organization, you've got three types of capital. Financial capital, we all know what that is, yes, so we don't need to spend time on that. Pragmatic capital is your unique capacity to satisfy customers. What do we do that nobody else does that enables us to generate revenue and take care of customer concerns? And then there's your symbolic capital, which is the bigger narrative that exists about you in the marketplace. It's a combination of your brand, right, and a bigger narrative about you. So let's watch. Quick primer on capitalism. All right, how many of you got your own companies? Pretty much everybody in the room. Excellent, All right? So let's just think. If you started your own company, which of the three types of capital did you start with? I hear mumbling, but no words. Well, you, you typically you start with one, and the one is you start with pragmatic. You had an idea, a product, a service, you had something that said, let's go do this, okay? Now, and this is where surprisingly most people in big companies don't get it, what comes next? Symbolic, see, everybody's, oh, you gotta get financial capital, no. Investors don't invest in products. They invest in stories. You need to have a powerful narrative about your pragmatic capital. That's what attracts investment capital. Then, in theory, the virtuous cycle of what we call capital conversion starts. So you convert one type of capital into another. So with more financial capital, I expand our pragmatic capital. We could expand our offers. We make more products. We enhance our products, et cetera, et cetera. That gives us more symbolic capital. All of a sudden now people are talking about, hey, there's this great new company. Have you heard about them? That makes it easier to recruit, right? That makes it easier to attract more customers, which in turn generates more financial capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Capitalism is not about how can I pull the most money possible out of the organization. It's how do I make the most effective capital conversions? Because if I do that right, I'll end up with substantial financial capital. One of the things that's got our economy stuck now, this is my sidebar rant, is we've got too many people trying to pull the financial capital out of organizations, not reinvesting it, 
right? We've got more financial capital sitting on the sidelines in the country now than we ever have in our history. And the problem is, if we don't keep it moving, as I try and explain to the finance guys, financial capital sitting by itself is just dirty paper. It's useless. In fact, it, it devalues due to inflation the longer it sits. Not surprisingly, I don't get a lot of traction with that conversation. <laughs>
but how most companies go about it, not so much. So watch. So we get bigger, and yet autonomy tends to go down. Why is that? It's my very extensive graphic work here. Right? So, right? Everybody wants to grow, right? Of course, right? Grow or die, basic principle of any living, living organiz organism. Right? Now the problem is, the more you grow, the more complex things get. So you've got more products, more services, more people, more customer, more interactions, and more possible combinations of all those. So what happens? Well, what happens is what we call the talent density tends to shrink. So the more complex it is, the farther our talent density goes down, not because the people are getting dumber, but the, the business is getting more complex. Right? Now what happens then in that gap, chaos. Does this sound familiar to some of you now? Right? See this guy? He's not happy. Right? So what happens is chaos shows up in that gap and people don't know what to do about it, so the traditional industrial era answer is process. Right? Now again, everybody, you, you need process if you're doing the same thing over and over, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, we don't need any process. Of course we do but we tend to kind of overdo it. Nobody really likes process for everything, but it seems prudent in the face of the other choice, which is chaos. The dilemma is more process, more rules, more regulations, less autonomy. See, there's another unhappy face. Is she gonna be sticking around for long? No, because your A-level performers won't put up with it. And again, I'm gonna argue many of you are sitting here in the room because of that. See, I even got an amen on that. Right? <laughs> now watch what happens. All right? This is where everybody can take a lesson here. So, we put in lots of processes and rules. We've kind of driven out some of our, what look like rabble-rousing, troublemaking A performers, but we're cool. We got a highly successful process-driven company. We got a leading market share. We are rocking it. We don't, we don't require lots of brilliant thinking because we got it all operating. You know, it's like that car we've got all tuned up. Don't touch nothing. It's working perfect. All right? All right? We make a few mistakes. We're very efficient. But we've left, lost some of our curious A folks. We're optimized. Optimized performance for our existing market. And then the market changes. Rut row. Yep. All right, so it doesn't matter. New technology, new competitors, new business models. The company, of course, then is unable to adapt quickly. Why? Because the employees have been extremely good at following rules and processes, and that's what the culture reinforces. So we generally grind slowly into irrelevance. All right, so let's do a little economics here. Now, as I said earlier, if you look at Lean and Six Sigma and all that stuff, they were designed to eliminate industrial era waste. And again, they have been extremely great at that, extremely great. Not quite so effective in eliminating the new wastes of the coordination era. Because right? they're blind to these things, as are all of our current financial measurements. So watch. What are the wastes? We call these the silent killers. Right? And I suggest to you that the waste of today is more insidious than the waste of yesterday, because unlike the waste of yesterday, you can't see any of these things. But if I go into an organization and I can walk around for about 20 minutes and give you a little mood reading, Right? If an organization is deeply in the grips of cynicism, distrust, resentment, and resignation, what do you think is going to happen to productivity? It's going to go down the toilet. And the HR people don't like me when I say this. You can do all the happy, clappy, motivational work you want, but if you don't get at that underlying mood, it's not going to make any difference. Right? Lack of listening. Right? As you well know, I don't mean hearing, everybody can hear, but listening is a real life competence that people can develop. We don't teach this in organizations. And so we have constantly people talking over each other, around each other. We're talking a lot, saying nothing, but not really coordinating. Yes? 
We've got a lot of bureaucratic work styles. We've talked enough about that. We spend way too much time worshiping information and analysis. We somehow send, tend to think that because you guys have got charts and graphs, that must mean that you know, they've got the truth. No, they don't. All of that tends to suppress innovation. Right? What's the biggest enemy of innovation in modern companies? Management. No, really. Management is the biggest enemy of innovation. Think about it. What is industrial era management designed to do? Eliminate surprises, deviations, disruptions, produce control, order, stability, and predictability. What is innovation? None of those. All right, so despite all the talk about it, we're really lousy at consistently producing innovation because all of our management systems and thinking are actually designed to prevent it, despite all that we say to the contrary. In some big companies, they've figured this out, so what do they do? They'll put together what they used to call them skunk works. Right? We take some innovation lab. Right? Nike has a special room. It's not even as big as this room. I know this because they're a client. Right? It doesn't matter who you are. You can't get into that room unless the CEO, or unless you work there, or the CEO writes you a path. Otherwise, you do not get in there. They are immune from all of the normal practices and processes. Right? Look at most major companies. They've done the same thing. We figured out that we're our own worst enemy here. And we've got to set up some sort of place where we can have people be a little more free to think and make mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And then you produce with all that, it sounds strange, but modern indentured servitude. It sounds very heavy, and to a certain extent it is. If you look at what goes on, you listen to the way people talk about their lives, their sense of joy and satisfaction and fulfillment most often does not come from work. And yet, where do you spend most of your time? Work. But listen to the way we all talk. Oh, yes, I can hardly wait for Friday, because then my real life begins. Right? My 72-hour real life. Right? We're going to have some real fun after work, right? et cetera, et cetera. It's, we, we, we've so become this that it, we, we, we've, we've forgotten that that's probably not normal or healthy. Right? I mean, really, where do you spend most of your time? At work. So wouldn't you want that to be a source of satisfaction and fulfillment and pride? I would think. Right? But we're in, we're in our own way about it. Now, let me show you, and this is the conversation I had with the finance guys where they end up not liking me. Because so I show them things that they're blind to. All right, so this is uh, uh, numbers that we put together for one of our clients who I won't name. Let's just say they're in Oregon and they make shoes and sportswear. <laughs> okay. So 35,000 employees. Out of that, I, I'm get, generously saying they've got 20,000 what we call coordination workers, people like you. So this is, takes away the retail employees, the clerical people, so forth. So we've got 20,000 coordination workers. All right. The average fully burdened salary for those folks is $90,000. Right. So do the math. 20,000 times 90,000, that's a billion, 800 million they're spending every year on their coordination workers. Tracking so far? Okay, here we go. Now, according to Gartner, McKinsey, a couple other research groups, the average American worker fulfills what he or she says they're going to do, which is to say on time, as scoped, on budget, 30 to 60 percent of the time. And the number's been going down because of all the ridiculous cost cutting in the last few years. So I am being at the same time generous and conservative and giving them 60%, the highest rate that the statisticians would allow us. Now, I take 60% of a billion, 800 million, that's a billion, 80 million. What that means is they're spending a billion, 80 million and getting exactly what we paid for. The math also unfortunately tells us they're spending 720 million and not getting what they paid for. Now we can't call that all waste because they're doing something, they're just not doing what they promised or said they were going to do. 
Now, I asked 10 CFOs, what's the opportunity cost of that $720 million? Not shockingly, I got 10 different answers. They range from 1x to 10x. I am a conservative guy, so I took a half x. Add those two together, there's a billion dollars a year that's leaking out of that company, and there is no financial system that can see it, let alone do anything about it. A billion dollars a year, and we're blind to it. Here's the exact same math on a smaller company, 2,000 people. Okay? In their case, there's $81 million a year leaking out the doors. What could any of us do with, if we could just recoup some or all of that? Now, the question is, how do you learn to do that? So to be clear, my little talk there enabled you to do what that's new? Go ahead, say it. Absolutely nothing, that's correct. <laughs> no, that's, that's absolutely right. Enabled you to do nothing. Hopefully it was kind of intriguing, you're still a little baffled because it went by kind of fast. But the truth of it is, as a result of that, you can't do anything differently. Now, what you might want to do is go, hmm, that was interesting, I want to learn some more, but let's talk about this phenomenon of learning. Because I asked you in the beginning, how many of you know everything you need to know to be successful leaders? I only got one hand. All right, and I suspect if I asked the question again, she wouldn't raise her hand again. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Mm -mm. Like, now I was kind of hoping you didn't say anything about it again. All right? All right? So that's all right, it's all right. The, the, the reason then, what that brings us to is, well, okay, that means we need to learn, yes? All right, that's only, the only way you develop anything is we need to learn. But the dilemma is much of what we think about learning is messed up. Right? So let's talk about why most F initiatives fail and then what you can do about it. Right? So the problem is we have three different interpretations about learning, two of which don't serve us very well. So there's learning as in to become aware of. So let's just take this example. I just showed you some new stuff about Leadership, yes? Yeah. Something you were not aware of 10 minutes ago, right? Right, right, now that's great, but can you do anything with that? No. Next then, there's learning to understand. This is the kind of learning that we do in school. So if you really wanted to learn some more about what I just said, you might say, well, do you have a book? Do you have something I want to read it? And then I would understand it. Yes? Okay. And then could you do something with it? No. Then there's learning to develop new competence, a new capacity for action. That's the part that matters. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the dilemma with most training programs is they settle for awareness and understanding, and what's really needed is the development of new competence. Here's the dilemma. No amount of understanding ever produced competence. The only way that you get competence is via practice. Now, think about this. This is where we kind of scramble your eggs a little bit. We've been taught that learning always occurs up here, and it ain't necessarily so. Right? While the mind understands, and understanding can occur in an instant, it's actually your body that learns. The mind understands, but it's the body that learns. Too often, we tend to think of this as the transport vehicle for this, and don't really pay attention to the unity of that. Now, our work, because we start off with athletes and people who are engaged in that way, we understand right, this phenomenon of producing mind and body. Right? The mind understands, but it's the body that learns, and the body only learns through practice. So let's take an example. How many of you know how to drive? I realize that's a matter of opinion in some cases, right? <laughs> but think about it. Early in life, you became aware of the phenomenon of driving, yes, so there's the top picture, right? 
And then at 16, 17, however old it was, you started the process of learning how, right? So in reading the driver's manual, you became aware of and understood the rules of the road, correct? Okay. But no matter how much you read the book, did that enable you to drive? No, right? You understood all the laws and theories, but that didn't get you a license. Now watch. The state then didn't say to you, I want you to visualize yourself driving, <laughs> right? And say these driver's affirmations. We'll give you a license, no. They didn't say, go see this movie about Formula One racing and then we'll give you the driver's license. D did they do that? No, okay. Did they say, read the one minute driver or chicken soup for the driver's soul or who moved my driver's license? No. No, here's an e-learning course, try that. You can do it online. No. Do they say, do any or all those and then we'll give you a driver's license? No, what did they say? Exactly, all right? Worst job in the world, driving instructor. Oh my God. Can you imagine? This is where all the Valium in the country goes. It's, think about it, being in a carload of teenagers that you're teaching to drive. No, thank you. All right, so the point to this is you had to practice before you could get the license. And now, think about what happens. You can get in the car, fire that baby up, put it in gear, and next thing you know, it's like magic. You're at work, and you got no idea how you got there. Right? You can drive down in any major city in this country at rush hour, and there's people putting along at five miles an hour. There's guys reading the newspaper. Right? Women are putting on their makeup. Right? Everybody's eating breakfast, or the thing now that we're not supposed to be doing at all, which is texting, right? right? Why? Because you have what we call embodied the competence of driving. Embodied means you can take the new action without having to stop, think about it, or look it up in some book. And competence is simply your capacity to consistently produce the desired result. Embodied competence. That's what we're after. The only way you get embodied competence is through practice. Does that make sense? All right. Now what I'm going to suggest to you is that the same is true for learning leadership, management, anything else. No amount of understanding is going to produce competence. And the dilemma with it is when we settle for doing tips and techniques and that sort of stuff, we actually produce cynicism which is one of the very things we're trying to fight against. And so too often companies go, well, we're just not gonna spend any money on training. Well, in part because what they've been doing doesn't work, and the problem is it's because they haven't done it enough, right? And because they haven't done it enough, they don't get the results. Because they don't get the results, we don't wanna spend any more money. We start this dangerous down cycle. So instead of having the capacity to develop our B players into A players, we dumb things down and drive the A players out of the organization. How brilliant is that? That would be the not so much answer. Right? So as I said, none of this is gonna be, do you guys much good. You're gonna build new competence with practice. The challenge is then to design practices for yourself that are gonna be effective in, in, in putting together the new enduring competences that you need for the new world that we're stepping into. Transformation, uh, we define it as a large amount of change in a small amount of time. Right? It is a revolutionary process as opposed to an evolutionary process. To the outside world, it kind of looks like magic. Right? But the reality is, it's just the result of focused work and rigorous adherence to a consistent, coherent process. Yeah, I know that's last year's, but we're... We're trying to ignore that last play. <laughs> All right, so watch this. I tell everybody, this is kind of embarrassing. It took me 10 years to figure this out, but thankfully for you, it's only gonna take about three minutes to explain it. Right? So if you really wanna transform an organization, or yourself for that matter, there's three things you need to pay attention to. All right? 
First is the mood in the organization. Now, mood and emotion are not the same thing. The easiest, the closest term you're probably familiar with is morale. They're, they're a little bit different, but let's just go with that. And they come in two flavors, green and red. Right? Green is technically what we call generative. Let's just go with positive. Red is degenerative, negative. Positive moods are things like ambition, confidence, trust. Negative ones, you can read there. Here's the, here's the deal. How many of you have worked in startup companies? Okay. What's the best thing about working in a startup? The mood, right? the freedom, the excitement, the ambition. Nobody ever started a business from resignation. <laughs> oh, this will never work. Let's, let's start a company. Yeah. Woohoo, yeah. Sign me up. I want to work for them. Right. Success is not us. Yeah, no. Right. Now, what happens as a result of our antiquated management practices, there's a direct correlation between the number of employees you have and the amount of time the organization has been around and the prevalence of that red list. Right? And again, many of you are here because you said no to that redness, yes? Yes, okay. Now, up here, we've got on the management practices, We've got those managers who actually know how to constitute, lead, and manage teams. They have the practices for cooperation, coordination. They know how to design what we call workflows. Down here, you've got the old hierarchical command and control management equals supervision characters, right? Now, the bottom scale are your systems and processes. And this is an interesting scale. It's a scale of coherence. On the negative end is incoherent, positive end is coherent. And by that, what we mean is the systems and processes must be coherent with the declared mood and practices that you want. So for example, people come to us all the time. They say, hey, we understand that you're some of the best people in the world about putting teams together. Can you get this department, division, whatever it is, to work together as a team? And we will invariably say, we can produce the short-term effect of teamwork, but tell me about your compensation system. Oh, it only rewards individual effort. Then you can forget about having a team in the long run because your comp system is incoherent with a mood of trust and, and uh, acceptance and doesn't work with the practices of cooperation and coordination. Not going to happen. Now, without any value being assigned to the blue box, in every organization, those three variables produce a stasis, a steady state. Right? Now, think about this. 99 times out of 100, when people say they want to transform the business, which of those axes do they start on? Systems and processes. Why? Because we live in the delusion that because we can see it and measure it, it must be the thing that matters. It's not. All right, now, many of you remember the whole thing about re-engineering, and now we've got all these new CPMs, we're going to have all these new systems and processes, and they make these big promises, and then what actually happens is that if you're lucky. Now, the other dilemma is, ooh, it turned pink. Look at that. Cool. Now, this is the motivational stuff. Let's go get fired up. Let's get motivation. We'll get all inspired. And you get people really jazzed up, but then they come back to work, and what happens? Oh, nothing changes. All right, so for them, unfortunately, something does change. They get more cynical. You gave me a little taste of what it could be like, but you're not supporting it with anything else? Oh, you think we were in a bad mood before? Watch this. <laughs> all right, so what we learned a long time ago is you need to do all three of these at the same time. You've got to work all three axes at the same time. Same is true for you as an individual. If I want to transform myself, I'm not going to transform myself out of resignation, am I? No. So I need to figure out what is it I'm ambitious about? What do I trust myself to be able to do? What practices do I need to put in place? And what are the systems I need to set up for myself to reinforce the new practices? Make sense? OK. Now, the place where you do need to start here is not systems and processes, but mood. The axiom that we use is mood is everything. If you've got paper, write that down. Mood is everything. It's not the only thing, but it's everything, because if you don't get that right, nothing else you do is going to matter. All right, now here's the analogy. In your life, 
How many of you have painted your house before? The outside. All right, what's the first thing you've got to do if you're going to paint your house? Scrape off the old paint, all right? How many of you like that job? No, that sucks, as we say, all right? Now, if you are A, uninformed and don't know you need to scrape off the old paint, or B, you're too lazy and you don't want to do it, and you just slap the new paint on, what happens? It's going to come right off. This is the same thing. You might have some really great systems and process. You might have some really cool new management practice. Try slapping that on top of resignation, resentment, arrogance, and cynicism and see how long it lasts. Right? This is my complaint about most of this new fad about engagement. Right? We're trying to do happy clappy on top of that red list. Doesn't work. Now, to be clear, you're never going to eliminate all that stuff, but if you don't go in and clear some of that out first, there's no point doing any of the rest of it. So, three central things. As we said, there's mood, management practices, systems, and processes. If we're not working all three, it's not going to be successful. There's three things, if you're in a bigger organization, that you also have to have, which is consistent executive support. These things are disruptive. They don't tend to stick if, you've got, if you don't have executives driving them. You've got to have critical mass. If you've got thousands of people, you can't just work with 25 and expect everything to be different. We've got to get a critical mass going. And you've got to have momentum. All right? the, the, the notion here is real simple. Everybody is all in favor of change as long as it doesn't mean me and it doesn't mean now. All right? Other than that, it's a perfectly good idea. They should get busy. All right? All right? Right? So you've got to keep the process moving once it starts. It's not something you can kind of dribble out over time because the, the inertia of the past is really strong. All right, making sense? All right. This is just a map for how we typically do these things. I'm not going to do the sales pitch, but what matters here is you can see it spread out over time. All right, so we build blocks on top of each other, and we put people together in little project teams. We put coaches, so Paul's one of our coaches. He works with project teams. That's how they learn the new practices, is by doing the real work. So we take projects that are your projects, not our projects, and show you how to put the new practices to work by doing what you're going to do anyway. Let's just show you a different way to do it. Our model looks like that. We start with values. So again, that's the key to everything. Then we put in the new practices, and then while that's happening, we work with you to put in your systems and processes so that by the time we're done, you've adjusted your comp system, your rewards, your recognition, your promotions, et cetera, so that it reflects then the utilization and development of all the new practices. 